I'm going to carry on with part three of um, it's harvest time. And I want to call this numbers in language. Say numbers in language. Now this morning, um, you will find, I'm going to do a little bit of recap, and then we're going to come to a junction. And then it's going to be a little bit, a little bit confronting. But how many of you know it's going to be good? Amen. Amen. Okay. So we bless the Lord for all of His goodness and for His faithfulness over our lives. Can somebody say amen? amen? And I pray that today your life will be changed again. And the Lord will invade your mind and your heart again. You see, every time the word comes, there must be an acceleration. There must be growth. There must be maturity. There must be an erection of Christ fully formed in a people. Because that's what the word comes to do, is to shape Christ on the inside of us. Amen? And I believe this is, doing, this is going to be the time in our life that we need to participate with God. Listen, I'm, I'm choosing my words carefully. There's going to be a time and a season now that we're going to have to participate with the Lord like never before. Saying that, I'm not that we haven't before, okay? But I think it's, it's a season where the Lord is going to become, if I can use this word, a little bit more meticulous in our lives, in our, passion, in our, in our, in our participation in the purposes of the world and that which God wants to accomplish, not only in your life, yes, your life, that's where it starts, but with the church as a whole, but also the body of Christ and what God wants now to take place and transpire in the earth. And I believe, and one of these days I want to bring a message that God is in the detail. I believe that God is in the detail. And, and, and sometimes, now you, I, I know immediately there's some questions. Just leave it. I, we'll get to that. But what about this? What about that? Forget about that now. I'll, I'll explain that to you when I get there. But I believe that God is so serious with us that God is in the detail of our lives. And we should allow Him to be in the detail of our lives. Now, I spoke to you about 2023 or the year, year 2023, and I explained that to you out of the Hebrew calendar as well as um, the Hebrew uh, uh, grammatica and, and, and also what the year 2023 means. But 23 the num it's the number, it's, it's made up of the number two and the number three. Number two, for instance, speaks of witness, and number three of the divine, speaks of the divine. And where there has got to be the participation of both. Okay? And therefore, as for us to experience the grace of God, I believe that we've entered into a season where God is looking for His people. I'm going to say something. Not just to wait. And I know this scripture says, those that wait upon the Lord. But that's for specific things. You see, um, Uncle Peter Leroux, now many of you don't know him, some of you know him. He used to have a, a saying, Boer, jy moet geestes geweld You have to have spirit tenacity. And many people are so passive, they're always waiting on the Lord to do something for them. Okay? There is this thing that's got to be destroyed in the life of the believer, and it's this, this waiting thing. And I don't mean just waiting for God to move. I mean where we've got this concept that we are waiting for God to do it versus going to God and get it done. I'm going to preach to a certain few people here. You know, you get caretakers, undertakers, and risk takers. Okay. How many of you know, all that we have, God has given us? And anyone grateful for God's blessings? Come on. I want you to know we've entered into a season where God's going to release things like we've never seen it before. But it's going to require something from you. Say yes. Okay, so recap. Daniel 2.21. And He changed the times and the seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. Look at that scripture. Can I be myself just a little bit? For a little bit. 
little bit rough around the edges. He's not going to give wisdom to the stupid. That's not what that scripture says. You see, he gives wisdom to whom? To the wise. And he gives knowledge to whom? Those who have understanding. In other words, what it actually means is this. We are after wisdom. We are after understanding. In our pursuit in life, in, in, in Proverbs says, in all of your getting, get understanding. So we are not just saying, sitting there passive and, and go through life haphazardly, but we pursue wisdom. We pursue understanding. So once we pursue wisdom, God will add wisdom. Do you see that? That's what he's after. And when we pursue understanding, God will give us knowledge. Listen to the insinuation. He removes kings and he raises up kings. That means orders will change. Authorities and powers will change. South Africa is not going to look the same like in 10 years time from now. Somebody needs to believe with me. He will give wisdom to the wise and wise and will give knowledge to those with understanding, which means this is not the time to mess with God. This is the time when we have to be engaged and engaging because we have come to Daniel 2.21 where God is going to change times and seasons. He's going to remove people and he's going to put people in place. He's going to restore, I believe. He's going to remove, he's going to replace, if you will. And I'm expecting God this year to change times and seasons and to remove certain kings and to replace them with others. Amen. Psalm 102. I had a meeting with Tinis in this week. I said, Tinis, you know what? One thing that I just realized more and more, everybody's replaceable. I said, that includes me. God is serious. Psalm 102 verse 13. I will arise and have mercy on Zion. Zion is an overcoming church. For the time to favor, yes, the set time has come. So the set time has come to favor who? The overcomers. That is what God is after. When the set time comes, God moves in divine acceleration. I said that last year, last, last week. He speeds up and he redeems the time. Because Ephesians 5, 16 says, redeeming the time because the days are evil. I feel like certain things are going to change quickly. Yes. And we're about to get better and we're about to get stronger in the Lord. Amen. Somebody say amen. amen. And then Amos 9, verse 11 to 13. On that day I will arise, or I will rise up to the tabernacle. I will raise up the tabernacle of David. That means God is going to restore worship, as I said last Sunday, which has fallen down and repair its damages. I will raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old. Behold, the days are coming. Behold, the days are coming. Coming, says the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper, that is acceleration of time, and the treader of grapes, him who sows seed. Anybody remember? So God is accelerating, if you will. This will be a year of overflowing, abundance. The year of the camel is the and it's the beginning of abundance. And then Jeremiah one verse twelve says, "Then the Lord said to me, You have seen well." For I'm ready to perform my word. I'm telling you, God is ready to perform a dimension of his word that we as the church has not experienced or has not seen up to now. God is going to pick up the pace. I will now restore the years that the locust has eaten, Joel 2.25, and you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. You shall be fulfilled. It's a season, I also said this, it's a season of divine favor. It is a favor that would overtake everything else, or if you will, it is an overtaking favor. It's an overtaking favor. But listen, it's not for everybody. Favor is something that God has to bestow or something that God has to put on you. It's not grace. Grace is there for everybody. God's, God loves us all, every one of us, but this is not loving everybody. Favor is not loving everybody. It's a bestowing, okay? He shed his love abroad in our hearts 
But favor is something that God bestows on us. We've learned that the love of God is shed abroad, but favor is something that God puts on you that sets you apart. A little, it's a little different than grace, though it is gracious, if you will. But it's specific and it is, watch this, it is purposed. Purposed. Favor always comes because of purpose. And it's for those that are connected or in action, in obedience, in purpose, in sacrifice. But it always happens in relationship and it's got the purpose of God connected to it. You know, God will watch you how you serve Him when you're alone. He will listen to the devotion of your life when you're by yourself. And favor comes by how you keep your word to Him. Example, if you give God a vow or make a vow, you say, Lord, I will do this. I will give that. I will... I will sacrifice this. I will do this. And, but I'm expecting this from you. Where you negotiate with God and you see through Scripture it happens often. You'll hear the servants of the Lord says, If I have found favor in your sight, will you do this? The thing is this. We've got to understand that God always keeps his side of the agreement. Say so yes. God always keeps his side of the agreement. So favor is something God puts on us that it's different than grace. It is usually, as I said, connected to some action that we do like obedience, sacrifice, and that is purposed to do something bigger than ourselves and always, and it's always a result of a relationship. For those of us that are connected to the vision or vision of God, there's favor in it. I said there's favor in it. I believe there's favor on us. I I release this word. I believe there's there's favor on my life. So you see it all through scripture. When God gives a man favor like Joseph, listen to this, watch this. This is another dimension of favor. Because mostly when we talk about favor, it's about how God blesses me. But we don't understand favor. Watch this. So when God gives a man favor, favor like Joseph he doesn't necessarily bail him out of prison but he favors him in prison watch this now and opens the purposes of God watch it not only for Joseph but for a whole nation so your jail your confinement where you find yourself in even though you might have the favor of God upon your life, it's where you have to come to the realization. It's not, oh, Lord Jesus, just get me out of the situation that I am. I'm so favored by God. I need to be blessed. People need to see how blessed I am and what nice car I'm driving, nice house. I'm saying, no, 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 no. God's going to keep you in that position. Because the, the, the purposes of God is much greater than just you and the little favor that He placed upon your life. God has got a nation in mind. Amen. An actual fact, if you look at that whole story, it was not only a nation. It was the nations of the world that came to Joseph to buy grain from Joseph. And then also to go fetch your family And bring them, and I will give them the best that Egypt can offer. And and, and Pharaoh gave them the land of Goshen. So purpose, listen, destiny is is connected with purpose. And purpose is much bigger than you yourself, you ugly thing. And, And that's what we have to understand. The sacrifices that you go through, the things required from you, you have to lift up your eyes from around you and put it on the horizon and realize, Lord, this is for a nation. This is for many other people whose lives you want to change, conform, transform into the image of Christ. Come on, somebody say amen. So the people of God came into an experience, and I say the people of God, but actually everybody came into an experience 
due to the favor of God upon the life of one person. We will begin to recognize that there's a separation. And I don't want this to be misunderstood, but he'll deal with you differently than he'll deal with others. He will not necessarily allow you to get away with things, but he will see to it that he will wrestle you, if you will. It, it has to. And why? Because he needs to change your nature. And listen, he will not ignore you. He's not going to leave you alone. I am many times to Lord, if you can just leave me alone. But he's not going to leave you alone. God will not leave you alone. So we concluded in part two of it, it is harvest time, that it's the, the year of divine favor, it's the year of Jacob, it's the year of mercy and grace, the year of wrestling and prevailing. It'll be like a year of Joseph where all, and all of these are allegories, God will, means God will again add. That's the name of Joseph. There's increase in every area of your life. And I told you then that I'm prof prophesying over you. And so though for the world it's going to be a year of exposure, a year of struggle, I believe some things are about to happen in our nation. Say amen. I think things are going to get shaken. Listen to my words, and I'm not a negative person. I believe things are going to get shaken. I mean shaken. It might even end up in the streets. There's going to be violence. Because people are at a place where they fed up. They had enough. But here it comes. I believe with all of my heart, the conclusion is going to be righteousness. It's a year of divine favor and acceleration, overruling favor that will redeem the time. But it's going to require, as I said, us participating. 2023 is the year of Jacob. Write this down. It's the year of mercy and grace. It's the year of mercy and grace. And notice, I didn't say the year 5783, which is the Hebrew calendar, though that's also true, talking from the Hebrew perspective. But for us, 2023 is the year of Jacob, the year of mercy and grace, the year of wrestling with God and prevailing. Now, I'm going to try to bring a, a short teaching quickly on numbers. And first we have to go to Genesis 32 verse 24 and we read this. Then Jacob was left alone and a man, capital letters, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. And I want you to understand these are pictures, pictures, prophetic understandings, not just historical happenings that you have to put yourself in it to understand it. So, now, verse 25, now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, this is the angel, Jacob, he touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go, this is profound, this is profound, you've got to check this down. He says, let me go, for the day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? He said to Jacob. He first asked, so what is your name? And he said, your name shall be no longer called Jacob, but Israel. For you have struggled with me, with God, and with men, and have prevailed. And then Jacob asked, saying, watch this now, watch this now, watch this now. And then Jacob asked, saying, tell me. Jacob is now begging. Your name, I pray. And he said, why is it that you ask about my name? And then he says, and he blessed him there. Where did he bless him? No, where did he bless him? You have to look at these words. He says he blessed him there. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel. I'll explain just now. For I've seen God face to face and my life is preserved. Which means he could have died there. When the angel asked Jacob, what is your name? He was reminding him of his old nature because he knew what his name was. When Jacob asked the angel, I tell you, I pray thee, I beg thee, what is thy name? In verse 29. 
And the angel answered, why do you ask my name? And he blessed him there. Now that word there is this. Hold fast to your seat. In that matter. In that respect. In other words, Jacob saw something divine. So he wanted to know. Uh, and the angel, and instead of saying them the name, he blessed him in it. Do you see that? Hallelujah. So once again. And he said, why is it that you ask about my name? And he blessed him there. So there was something about this angel that Jacob needed to know. He wouldn't let him go. He knew there's something in him that Jacob needed and was willing to die for until he got it. He said, why are you asking what is my name? And it means it is a continuation of the same thought. And he blessed him there. So instead of saying his name, he blessed him with a name. He blessed him there. Someone say there. Now, the word there in the Hebrew is the word shama, sham, uh, where we get the word shama from. And that's Ezekiel 48, 35. And the name of the city from that day shall be the Lord is there. The Lord is there, Shama. Same word as Jehovah, Shama. The Lord is there. So Jacob wrestled Jesus and he became a prince and he called the name of the place Peniel, which means to turn and see the face of God. Not only will he, listen, he needs to change your nature for you to be able to see his face. Delivered preserved, rescued, and recovered. So 2023 is a year of recovery, but it's going to require a wrestling match, if you will. Ezekiel 48, 35 says that the Lord is there. That's the name. Shama, Jehovah, Shama, the Lord is there. So Jacob wrestled Jesus, and he becomes a prince, and he calls the name of the place, I saw the face of God. Peniel means I, I turned and I saw the face of God and I was recovered. Isn't that beautiful? So 2023 is a year of recovery. Some needs recovery. So today's word is a word for those who are serious. Now we're going to change gears a little bit. Okay? How many of you are serious with God? It's for those that are serious about God. And this is not a, a year... To kind of be hanging just around, hang out and wait to see what God is going to do. This is a year that's, got, that's going to require you to step out of yourself and out of your limitations and come into an experience with God that will break things off of your life. That's a mouthful. Proverbs 25, 2. It is the glory of God to conceal a matter, but the glory of kings, of who? Of kings. Is to do what? To search out a matter. So God wants us to search out. God wants us to press in and search out. We have to do something. Can you see that? God has designed everything to be weighed, measured, and numbered. Unless it can't be measured or numbered like His presence or His glory. Okay? Going somewhere. Isaiah 40, 12. Who has measured the waters? Weighed the mountains in scales. See, so in scripture you find numbers is language. Okay? Psalm 147 verse 4. He counts the numbers, the number of the stars. And then he calls all of them by name. Do you see that? So there is language in numbers. It's describing something. It's telling you something. So we've learned in Hebrew, each letter has a name, a meaning, and a numerical value. Remember that? So listen carefully. I just, want you to make I just want to make sure this is always in your mind so it always keeps a balance. Listen, there's no power in numbers. Listen to me. The power is in the Word of God. Okay? One more time. There's no power in numbers, but there's power in in the Word of God. So I do not believe in numerology. I believe in the Word of God. 
So when the Lord says, as an example, cast your net on the other side. Remember when they went to catch fish and they couldn't find fish? And he said, just cast over to the right side. And they caught 153 fish. Not 154, not 152, but 153. In that is a message. Now, I don't have time, but it's actually describing the sons of God. We have to also understand it means harvest time. Okay, so we'll leave that for another time. So I'm not, I'm not an expert on the subject, and I also don't intend to be. But in English, for example, we have numbers. But in Greek and Hebrew, they have letters that gives us numbers. It is called numerals. Numerals, watch this now. So in Hebrew and Greek, they have letters like A is 1, B is 2, and so on. Then you get 10. They have 10, 20, 30, 40, 100. And then they have the last four letters of the Hebrew alphabet. They have 22 in it. So the last four letters of the alphabet is 100, 200, 300, and 400. Now just get the book by Bullinger uh, Numbers. And you can read all about it there. So in the Romans, the Romans used numerals, which was letters. For example, it is I, V, X, L, C, D, and M. So for example... If you were to look at, at Psalm 147, verse 4, like we just saw, they would describe it like this. CXLV2, that's for 147, and then dot, and then the verse is 4. That's an I and a V. Okay, you've got, you know that. Okay. So, you go do a study in your own name, your own time. That means that every single, um, every single word in the Bible is a number and every single scripture is a number. Therefore, God, God's word is ma mathematically perfect. I want to show you something. But we don't want to get caught up with numbers. We don't want to get caught up, but we want to get caught up with the word of God. Amen? But we need to understand, uh, have an understanding or at least a, a basic understanding of biblical numerology. Now, many have misunderstood numbers as they have in astronomy to where they become instruments of witchcraft. And we have to be careful. Everything that we do, everything must glorify God. Everything, okay? So watch this down. I don't, um, if you want to write this down, write it down or get the tape and listen to it, but I have to run through this thing quickly. So the basic numbers and scriptures, and I'm going to give you the meaning from 1 to 23. From number 1 to 23. So the moeder. Okay, so here we go. Number one, what does it mean? God is sovereign and always represents unity. Scripture says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Okay, the number two is, is a faithful witness. We get the two witnesses in the book of Revelation. Number three means divine perfection. Out to court, holy place, most holy place. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Egypt, wilderness, promised land. There's so many other examples. Number four means creation. God's creative realm, if you will. Four seasons, four main elements, water, fire, air, earth. Four lunar systems. There's much more, but you have to see this all through the universe. And you will see it. And then number five means grace. God's gift of himself to us, humanity, grace. Six means man or the flesh. Speaking of the physical or God doing a work in the midst of humanity. Eight, uh, seven means sp uh, spiritual perfection um, and completion. Eight, the new beginning or resurrection. And it also means super abundant. That's what it means. These are all Hebrew grammatica. Word nine means judgment on one side. That means the end of a thing and fruit bearing on the other side. That's why the woman has to carry the baby nine months for the fruit to bear. Number 10, it means perfect order, the Ten Commandments or tithe. 11 represents disorder on one side and overcomers that are rising or a new beginning on the other side, like you see in Hebrews chapter 11. Twelve means perfect government and rule. It's 12 hours in a day, 12 hours a night, 12 months of the year, 12 major constellations in heaven, 12 tribes of the nation of Israel, 12 original apostles. And so you see it through, throughout, not only in the natural, but also in the spiritual. Thirteen 
means rebellion on one side and Jesus coming to rescue among the 12 on the other side where he became the 13th apostle. 14. It means generational promises. 14 generations. Matthew 1 verse 17. From Abram to David. 14 generations. From David to Babylon. That's all in Matthew chapter 1. 14 generations from Babylon to Christ. That's why the 42nd generation is the Christ generation. 15 means consecration or set apart. 16 means the love of God. 17 means overcoming victory. It's overcoming. Not overcoming the victory, but it's overcoming victory. 17 promises in the book of Revelation uh, to he that overcomes will sit on the throne. It also means the perfection of spiritual order. Perfection, 17. Number 18, bondage on one side and life on the other. 19 means exploits of faith. You have 19 heroes of faith in Hebrews 11. You see, everything is orchestrated. Everything is numbered. Everything is lined up in the Word of God. Number 20 means expectancy. Number 21 is the numbers 3 times 7 or 3 plus the number 7. It has the three in there and the seven in there. It means divine and spiritual perfection. Divine and spiritual perfection. Then the number 22. It means revelation, light, or the light of revelation. Then comes number 23. And it is shocking. It's disturbing. Fasten your seatbelt so you don't run away. And don't panic, I've got the good news. But it's facts. Everything was good right up to now? Okay. So this is where everything changes. Whenever God speaks prophetically of a season, we have to pay close attention to all of the aspects, amen, of the season. So we looked at 5,783, the Hebrew year, and also, but we live in 2023 now. This year of the camel, which is the year 2023 to us, is also the year of 20, which is expectancy, but also three. So we have 23, 20 and three. Here we go. This is what it means. Throughout the whole Bible, it means death. No rockets telling you. Let it hang there for a while. It means death. Better still, this is actually what it means. It's the number of overcoming death and coming into resurrection power. Somebody got to say hallelujah. The word killeth, killeth in the English, not kill or killed, but killeth. You'll find that word 23 times in the Bible. Baptism, like when you're baptized with water, When you lose your old life and rise into one new life, baptism appears 23 times in the Bible. The word leaven appears 23 times in the Bible. The word hell in the New Testament, 23 times. Therefore, it's the year to kill something or to die to something. I say it's the year to kill something or to die to something. It's not the time to avoid what you've been avoiding. Like some people, uh, my wife would call it like like, uh, uh, ostriches. They put their head in the sand. Everything's happening around about them, but their head is right there. They They pretend as if nothing is happening. You understand what I mean? This is not that year. This is not that year. It's not the time to avoid. We've been avoiding, watch this. We have been avoiding what, we, what scares us. We've been hiding from and just hoping this thing will go away. It's not the time to avoid what has hindered us, scared us, hide from our problems and hope it will just go away. There's a good stuff. It is a time to take them head on 
and get rid of them once and for all. It's time that hell gets out of your life and never comes back again. So whatever has intimidated you, opposed you, and hindered you, it's now the time for you to kill that thing. You're going to have to wrestle it and kill it. This is the year that death, hell, and the grave be dealt with in every area of your life. The fear of death and anything related to it, all of their kind, all their influences have no place in the life of a believer. Listen carefully. When I say this is here that death, hell, and the grave be dealt with, them and all their kind, all the kind that brings about death in your life, where you don't have the ability, the power, and the guts to move forward in the things of God. All the influence of hell and grave, all that which is attached to it, can have no place in our lives. Whatever has intimidated us before, we will now intimidate. That's what I said by many people just sitting and waiting for stuff. No, stand up. Take up your rightful position and say, no longer. Draw the line in the sand. This is it. Amen? Now, the word death in the Bible is, you'll find it 138 times, which is 6 times 23. It means the death of man or the death of flesh. Romans 6, 23. 6 and 23. Here we go. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And so again, the word death is in the Bible. How many times? 136, which is 6 times 23. And we find Romans 6, 23 says, The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Is it coincidental? That these numbers line up or not. Maybe or maybe not. But I think God is talking to us. God is telling us. It's time for us to defeat whatever in our life is related to sin. And when I talk about sin. It's missing your purpose in life. Missing the mark. Death in the grave. But on the other side. It is the gift of eternal life. That is how the number 23 works. It, rep it represents the end or the death of something and the transformation into something new. Hallelujah. Now, 23 is also 10 plus 3. 10 plus 3. Watch this. God is a genius. Which is, which is, um, uh, uh, or, uh, yeah, 10 plus 3, which is 13. Mean, it means this. It's God bringing His perfect law, which is number 10. God bringing His perfect law, which is the Word of God, to man's rebellion, 13. And transforming him into something new, like Jacob to Israel. Isn't God phenomenal? Now watch this. The 23rd time Noah's name is mentioned in Scripture. It's in Genesis 7:23. So he destroyed all living things which were on the face of the, of the ground, both man and cattle, creeping things, and the bird of the air. They were destroyed from the earth. Only Noah and those who were with him in the ark remained. That's the rapture. Isn't that interesting? So what did God remove? All the unrighteous. It is the 23rd time that the name Noah was mentioned. After coming through the flood, death gave way to a newness of life, which is the number 46, which is 2 times 23. So it means the destruction of death. John 2, 19, Jesus said, destroying this temple, and in, the third, and, and in three days I will raise it up again. Looking at the number, it says 3. Destroying this temple, and in three days, Jesus says, I will raise it up again. And, and, and if you look at the 46, it took 46 years to build the temple, the natural temple. But Jesus said, he was speaking to his body, showing in his body, he will take that which has been dead, and he will bring it back to life in three days. 
Hallelujah. Again, 23 is also double pronunciation. It's the promise of life out of death, the number of resurrection. Now the phrase, the bread, as in the bread of life, is found 46 times in 46 verses of the Bible, and it all speaks of Jesus. God's word is mathematically perfect, perfect and perfect in numbers. Are you learning something? You see, I feel like this year God is going to break poverty off of me. I'm talking about myself. And it's not that I'm poor. I'm saying something. I mean, so that I have no more financial restrictions. God's going to cancel some of your debts. Amen. And what we need is we need a lot of finances to be able to do what God means. Tina spoke about it the other day. Tina and I. About what we want to do for God, there cannot be any limitations anymore. Now, I don't mean more money to buy things and stuff. That's not what I'm saying. I, Ben Klein, has got everything that I need. I really do. But we can't do what God's called us to do with wishful thinking of gold falling out of the heavens and gold dust and all kinds of spooky stuff. This is going to require major financial miracles. So I'm in a position now, watch this, what I'm saying carefully, where I don't have time to be weighed down by people of hope. But with people of faith that are not going to just be waiting on God to do something while there's issues God wants them to get rid of in their lives, remove the excessive weight and put us in a position where we will see the fulfillment of what God has called us for. Are you with me? And therefore it's going to be each one of us coming to that place alone like Jacob as it's the year of Jacob, and wrestle with him, with Jesus. And whatever it is you got to get rid of is going to change, even is going to cause a change in your nature. And those things that does not belong to you, you have to see that you wrestle it till you get rid of those things out of your life once and for all. And you're not going to let God go until he blesses you. Even if you walk with a limb, but you have a new walk with God. Hallelujah. I'm talking to those that say, God, I'm not going to carry into the following here the old things. I want a new thing. And, and if, this is, if, if this is a new beginning, it requires whatever it requires. I know it's requiring a new mindset, a new vessel, a new heart, a free mind so that I can move and, and, and do that which God has called me to do. And I'm willing to pay the price to be able to get there because those are the people that we're going to see the distinction of the favor of God upon their life and how God's just going to come through for them and everything they touch, everywhere they walk, whatever they do, we will see the favor of the Lord upon their lives. Hallelujah. So Jesus says, I'm going to destroy this temple which took 40 years to build, but I'm also going to raise it up in three days. So 23 double nine shares in the promise of life out of death. Life out of death. Say life out of death. Now watch this. So we have to go to Psalm 23, which I'm going to close with. We're going to read verse 1. And we're going to notice that Psalm 23 only has six verses. Why not seven? Come on. Because Psalm 24 starts with the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. When does that happen? It happens when? After verse 6 of Psalm 23. Now let's look at it. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. That means I have no need. This is after we've wrestled all of those things out of our lives. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Not for you. For His name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Do you see that? I will fear no evil. 
For you are with me, your rod, your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Verse 6. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell where? In the house of the Lord forever. I give you an assignment. Memorize verse 6. Goodness means bountifulness bountifulness it's the year of the camel so if we begin with the lord is my shepherd it would be our daily and should be our daily declaration listen carefully this song is written from the perspective of a sheep that is always dependent on the shepherd it is a sheep writing it david here writes as a sheep and the sheep decides, I'm going to write a song to my shepherd. And the Lord is my shepherd. And I shall have no needs. Jesus is called the good shepherd in John 10 verse 11. And he's also called the great shepherd in Hebrews 13 verse 20. So if you were to say, just contemplate, think that the Lord is my shepherd. Every night when you go to bed, say, the Lord is my shepherd. I mean, just, just that alone, just that theme, what it means. I shall not want. It's a promise. And if you think of it, he makes me lie down. Just the sword that he gives me peace. Just think about it. In where? Not in the wilderness. In green pastures. And he leads me besides not stormy waters, but still waters. And what does he do? He restores my soul. Whatever mark that life has left on your soul, the Lord is saying, He will restore your soul because He's your 23rd, He's your shepherd. Whatever the anguish of your soul, whatever the battle of your soul, Whatever the fight, whatever the weakness, whatever the failure, whatever the shortcoming, He restores my soul and He leads me in paths of righteous name for his, righteousness for His name's sake. Though I walk, watch this, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, that means not dying. It's a shadow. Do you see that? Not dying. But it looks like it. It feels like it. Many times it feels like your life is drained. There's no more energy. There's nothing left. It feels like you're busy dying. Hallelujah. He says, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. You are my rot, your authority, your power, your staff. They comfort me. Come on, if you need comfort, it's your shepherd. 2023, he is your good shepherd. Hallelujah. And so when the enemy comes all around you, whatever that enemy might look like, you prepare a table before me in the presence to anoint me in the presence, in the presence, in the presence of my enemies. And while they are watching, you anoint my head with oil and my cup runs over and goodness thank you Jesus goodness and mercy shall follow me through all of my years no 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 it says days in other words it means daily daily all the days not next year all the days of my life and I'm going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever so we need to meditate on these six verses. Repeat them. Look at them. Look at the theme. Each one of it's in its own. Repeat them. Say them. They will change your thinking. They will change your walk. They will change your life. They will change your talk. You'll be, you'll be, it will become part of your nature. Six verses for the number of man. 66 means God with man. God with man. The Bible has 66 books in it. Watch this. And it's for our journey. It means it takes us from here to there. That's what it means. From here to there. The number 66 means from here to there. I mean, it takes us to a place called there. That's the most holy. 
It takes us to a place called there. From a mere man to a king. 66 books from fallen man to royalty. It's the number of royalty. So we have to get from here to there. And I pray that we would never come back to this place called here. Hallelujah. Ever again. Whatever has kept us here can't keep us here anymore. That's where, that's where we're going to get from here to there, there. And no power. I want to say this. No power of hell is going to stop you. Because this is your year. God has called you. He's made the announcement. He says, now it's time to have a tenacity in your spirit. Say, the Lord is my shepherd. I'm going somewhere. I'm not going to stay where I am, where, I've, where, I'm, where all of this stuff, where I'm conducive to all of this stuff. But I'm going to go to a place, that a place called their place of royalty in Him. This year we have to believe God that we're going to be free of everything that has held us back to fulfill the destiny and the purpose that God has called us. It's the year of the overcomer. The year that God is going to break the chains off of you. We have to be willing that whatever we got to lose out of our life to be able to go from here to there, that we'll be willing to let go of it. And let me just say, whatever is of God will meet you there. Hallelujah. When you come there, whatever is of God will meet you there. We got to go there. So whatever has been holding us back, keeping you from getting there, it could be fear, it could be need, a needy mindset, it could be a, a battle in your life. There's some stuff that's hindering you, obstacles in your life. We need to break every barrier, every restriction, every limitation. Get rid of the excess weight, unnecessary things in our life, distractions, oppositions, and we need to get out of this place. We, 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 get, we, we can go to that place called there. From Genesis to Revelation is from here to there. Why? Until we turn after we wrestle and we see the face of God. I want to see the God, face of God. I want to see the face of God. And I believe this is the year that God is going to give us so much grace and favor that we can break out of every limitation, everything that has held us back to make that journey, that transition and journey. And while we're journeying, that our nature will be changed. Everything on the inside of us will be changed. And that God will unlock all of the resources of heaven so we will be able to fulfill the very destiny that God has called us. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I love you.